On behalf of Planet Women and One Tree Planted, I am truly delighted to welcome you all to this event to celebrate women leaders on the front lines of forest protection. Bienvenidas a todas que están aquí con nosotras. Es un gusto tenerlas. I live and work in the ancestral and unceded land of the Ohlone Indigenous Peoples, also known as Hayward, California. And I recognize that I benefit um, from the occupation of this land and respectfully acknowledge the Ohlone people and others that continue to live in the Bay Area today. My name is uh, Paulina Arroyo. I am a board member for Planet Women and a nonprofit that invests in women-led, women-focused solutions to the environmental crisis and to environmental solutions. Currently, I'm the Director of Adaptive Management and Evaluation at the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation, a philanthropic foundation based here in California. But what really defines me as a person is my conviction that women hold the power to the environmental solutions that we need, especially now more than ever. I've been involved in conservation sector for more than 25 years. And almost all of that time, I have focused on the inclusion of women, indigenous communities in environmental conservation. I learned very early on in my career that women do have a driving force for change at all scales and in all sectors. So it's truly wonderful to see such an amazing turnout. We have 73 people on the call. Uh, so wonderful to see this amazing turnout for this event, especially to celebrate today, International Women's Day. I do also wanna acknowledge that we're living in a time where the news is very dark and our hearts go out to continued suffering around the world and wishing for peace. But this is also a good moment for us to focus on where there are some bright spots in the world and the importance of equity and justice in this world. You may all have seen that last week, the uh, IPCC report came out and it details many ways in which climate change has already caused severe dam damage to people and nature. What's notable about the report that came out last, last week though, is that it underscores the, that equity and justice for women, youth, indigenous peoples, and all marginalized people are essential to the global climate resilience. This is a groundbreaking statement from 270 scientists and housed within a report that's going to inform governing bodies. So in, for, for me in particular, I, I found it incredible that finally it's getting to, it, this message is being elevated, something that many of us have worked on for so many years, but it's getting elevated in reports that will catch attention of all sectors. Planet Women was founded on the same belief, that diverse leadership and gender equity are essential to innovation and success at all levels of the environmental sector, both from the field, working on the ground, but also in the boardroom. And in all, in all realms, women have to be in leadership roles. Like the IPCC report, more and more studies show that empowering women is critical to tackling climate change, saving nature, and helping communities. And in fact, now we have more evidence than we probably did 10 years ago of what we are saying. So the re research is showing us that greater representation of women in government, for instance, leads to stricter environmental laws and lower carbon emissions. We also have evidence that women are more likely to make decisions that support public good and the welfare of nature. And in fact, when women are included in conservation or management of natural resources and are in roles of decision-making, it results in stricter extraction rules, better compliance with regulations, and overall better conflict management. But we have a narrow window of time to make a transformative change. We need more women leading the way, and we need men allies and women, especially those underrepresented in rep underrepresented communities, to have a voice in how we care for our earth. When my daughter graduated from marine biology a couple of years ago, she said to me one day, it's so hard and depressing sometimes to be a conservationist. How do you do it? And, and I know it's hard and I have high hopes though that, and I'm inspired by the new generation of, of women out there who are much bolder and taking on challenges and challenging the system in a way that I have not seen in, in the past. So there are many persistent dedicated leaders like those who you will hear from today who are still fighting the good fight 
and creating a better future in all corners of the world. So we can do this together. And now I'd like to welcome Kylie Hughes from One Tree Planted. Kylie is a forest manager for One Tree Planted and oversees the tree planting projects in Western United States. And thank you, Kylie, for helping to plan this wonderful event. Thanks, Paulina. Hi, everyone. My name is Kylie Hughes. As Paulina mentioned, I am a forest manager for One Tree Planted. One Tree Planted is an environmental nonprofit that aids global reforestation. This event is a launch to our Women for Forest series. The goal of this event is to empower and provide tools, resources, and knowledge for women in the environmental field. In partnership with Planet Women, we have created the Women's Fund for Forests. The fund aims to plant 5 million trees over the next five years. The fund will not only help to put trees in the ground, but it will demonstrate the benefits of conducting environmental work with gender balanced and diverse teams. We will be speaking more about the fund and the upcoming requests for proposals and ways to stay engaged with the series at the end of the event. And we'll also send out a follow-up email um, with lots of actions and next steps. So I'll turn it over to Joanna Marshall, Planet Women's Director of Marketing and Development to kick off our speaker portion. Thank you, Kylie. Um, that was a wonderful beginning. I'm very excited. I'm so honored to be here welcoming three truly inspiring women leaders. Uh, as we heard from Paulina, we're at this moment of global transformation, and we now have the privilege to hear from three women who are leading the way in that transformation. Dr. Gladys Kalema Zikusoka, Kaz Gyoze, and Isabella Cortez. Even though their stories are very different, they've all spent their lives helping people thrive by helping nature thrive. And before we dive in, I wanna to touch on some logistics. We have three guest speakers today. Each will share for about 15 minutes. Then you'll be invited to join one of three breakout rooms where each speaker will host a Q&A. Uh, so feel free to type questions in for the speakers in the chat as we go and moderators will keep track of those or you can save your questions and ask them at the end in the breakout room. So you'll get more info in the breakout rooms at the end of the speaker portion, but just keep track of those questions. Uh, so our first guest today is Dr. Gladys Kalema Zikusoka, founder and CEO of Conservation Through Public Health, an organization that protects endangered mountain gorillas that live in windy, impenetrable forests in Uganda. CTPH is focused on benefiting wildlife health by improving community health through things like education, family planning, and mobile health clinics. Trained as a veterinarian, Dr. Gladys became the first ever wildlife vet for the Uganda Wildlife Authority at only age 26. She spent years treating gorillas in the wild and conducting research on zoonotic disease transmission. She's won many, many awards and was recently named one of the 100 most influential women in Africa by Vance Media. So welcome, Dr. Gladys. <laughs> Thank you for being here today. Yeah. Uh, so I have a couple questions prepared for you, uh, if we can just dive in. So the first one that I wanted to start with, Dr. Gladys, is tell us about the importance of combining community health and wildlife health when it comes to protecting forests and nature while meeting the needs of local people. Thank you so much for inviting me on this very exciting panel and happy International Women's Day, everyone. <laughs> um, it is very important to combine community health and wildlife health. I, my, this journey for me began quite early on when I was setting up the veterinary unit for the Uganda Wildlife Authority. Much as I was concerned that the, wild, the wildlife was not having any veterinary care, and you had endangered species such as the mountain gorilla, which at that time were only about 650 in number. I realized that people are important quite early on in my job. Just nine months after I'd been hired um, as a first vet for the Wildlife Authority, I was told that the gorillas were losing hair and developing white scaly skin. So I asked, I spoke to a human doctor friend of mine and I asked her, what is the most common skin disease in people? knowing that the reason I was hired was because gorilla tourism had just begun and they were concerned that people are going to make gorillas sick. Tourists who flew in from all over the world to visit the critically endangered mountain gorillas at the time. And they may bring a fatal flu such as COVID-19 and everyone was worried about that. So that was part of the reasons why they hired me at that time in 1996. And 
so I was concerned that anything, any that thing that people had could also affect gorillas. And when she told me that the most common disease is scabies, when we traveled up to the park, we carried the treatment for scabies, which you can actually luckily treat with ivermectin. One dose is enough. And when we got there, I went with the vet from the Kenya Wildlife Service. He was their vet advisor, Dr. Richard Koch. He told me he had seen sarcoptic mange in cheetahs that were being visited by very many vehicles, and he, it could be stressed. So when we got there and found out it was scabies, we treated the gorillas, they got better, um, except that the baby gorilla unfortunately died um, because we got there when it had lost almost all its hair and was even crying, which is very rare for gorillas to, to hear them crying loudly. And it was a lot of distress, having lost 75% of the hair, also died of secondary pneumonia. Mm -hmm. And so luckily they all recovered with ivermectin treatment. And a couple of years later, everyone started saying, well, the gorillas may be picking up something else. Um, maybe it's from the community. And we eventually we proved that it was from the community. And they were like, you need to make sure that the people aren't openly defecating. They should cover their rubbish heaps. They should start having proper toilets. And everyone turned to me because I was the only vet in the whole organization at the time. And they thought I was the only one who had any form of public health training, which is true because vet public health is almost the same as community public health. Um, so I went ahead and developed these brochures and that was a, like a turning point in my life because having designed these brochures and holding health education workshops with the villages, and these are the villages where gorillas are always coming out of the park and talk to them about, you know, how people can make gorillas sick. And I asked them what, I was about to tell them what I think they should do. And the ranger touched my arm and said, let them tell us what they think should be done. And they came up with much better ideas than I had. I was going to suggest for them. So that was very a great eye opener for me as a veterinarian who was used to solving people's problems. Um, they, I could tell that they could solve their problems better for themselves, you know, in a way that is very practical, having highlighted the issues. And a lot of what they decided, what they recommended, is what we used to start the nonprofit a few years later. Um, some of it involved, like you know, strengthening the human gorilla conflict team that hurts gorillas back when they come out, because these gorillas got the scabies when they went to people's gardens and ate people's banana plants, you know, because once they lose their fear for people, they start ranging probably where they used to range before. Um, and unfortunately, because of the very high human population growth, slowly the population, people were cutting down trees. And when it turned from a forest reserve to a national park, they couldn't cut trees anymore, but they still continued cutting some trees. But the gorillas could now start ranging freely again once they were habituated. And that's probably where they picked up the scabies. And so another thing that they brought up was they wanted continuous education about these issues. And then they also felt that it was important to bring health services closer. And this happened actually shortly after, a few months after we had the Windy Massacre, which was a terrible time when tourists were killed by rebels coming from DRC, who were uh, Hutus from the Rwanda, geno the genocide in Rwanda. And so they came and they, you know, some tourists were killed, the warden was killed, and tourism stopped for a couple of months. The time that we went out to talk to the communities, tourism had just started again, and there were very few tourists coming. And so I asked them, you know, how many of you love gorillas? Almost everyone puts up their hand. I said, why? Because tourists come and they, they're able to give money for our children to go to school and we're developing as a community. But one place that we went to that did not have tourism and wanted tourism, the reaction was a bit different. And another one in DRC, they denied that they're even seeing gorillas just because they never had any benefits. And so we decided to set up conservation through public health in uh, 2003 after while well, doing a master's and zoo medicine residence in North Carolina, together with my husband, Lawrence Ikusoka, and a vet technician, Stephen Rubanga, who was working at the Ministry of Agriculture, um, and other founder members. And we felt that we needed to improve the community health together with the gorilla health, because you couldn't keep the gorillas healthy without improving the health of the community. But even as we went along, we found that, you know, it's not just about the gorillas, it's their habitat, you know. In order for the gorillas to remain healthy and for their populations to grow, their habitats have to be secure. So in this journey of setting up conservation through public health from 2003 
we we added another element in our programs which was connected to saving the habitat of the gorillas the forest habitats and such things included you know like family planning for example you may ask what does family planning have to do with you know population health environment have to do with you know the gorillas it has a lot to do with the gorillas because we found that many people were having too many children and they could not um, give them proper health care and they couldn't send them to school. So it, they would even say that I have 10 children, half are for chasing wildlife from the garden and half are for going to school. So you can imagine those who don't go to school, what kind of a future do they have? And most often it was always the girls who stayed behind and the boys who went. And so they would end up being the teenage pregnancies and you know, you're just going to break the poverty cycle. Because if you start having children when you're 15, you're definitely going to have 10 children, you know, in your lifetime or even more. And so all of this, and because of that, then they needed to depend on the forest more, to poach more, more mouths to feed. So that made a lot of sense to me, why we should add family planning on a, on a model that was preventing infectious, infectious disease. Um, and then after that, we also added, um, we found out that many people are unhealthy because they were poor. And so we added an alternative livelihoods program where we started to engage coffee farmers around the park um, with Gorilla Conservation Coffee. This is my favorite gorilla, Kanyonyi. Um, we named the first brand after him. <laughs> I operated in his older sister when he was little and she just loved babysitting him. And we felt that there were many farmers living around the park who are not getting a fair market or a steady price. And yet, even as you trade gorillas, you meet these farmers um they couldn't be rangers the windy the national parks the uganda wildlife authority did well in hiring most people from the local community to be rangers when the park when the park was created but not everyone could be a ranger not everyone could be a porter who carries tourist luggage to the gorillas not everyone could sell crafts food accommodation or show community walks so the coffee farmers were a piece that was missing and we thought why not create a global brand of coffee that can save gorillas actually my husband suggested that and it's luckily the coffee was good and we we're able to engage these farmers and we found that many of them were poaching because it was easier for them to go into the forest and kill a diker or a bush pig luckily people don't eat gorillas in uganda and rwanda but other parts of africa where they're found they eat them because it's a delicacy for them um but uh gorillas could get caught in snares and one even got speared during the pandemic by a hungry bushmeat poacher when tourism went down. So we found that all of this was needed on top of use, encouraging people to have clean energy stoves where they can use less firewood from the forest. So all of it made sense that you could actually, in order to be able to ensure wildlife health, you needed to have community health also improved. And one other thing we found is that by improving community health, we're showing people that we don't only care about the forests and the wildlife, we also care about them because healthcare is a basic human need and a basic human right. And so that in itself improved their attitudes to conservation. <laughs> You've covered all the bases. It's incredible. You've done so much in your career. It's amazing. Um, I'm, I'm glad you were able to explain how all these pieces weave together, the community health, the wildlife health, the habitat protection. and. Um, and I know some of the protocols you are working on are even being applied to the COVID-19 crisis. So you really are doing it all. Um, I wanted to ask, and you, you started to touch on this a little bit with the family planning. What is the unique role that you see women playing? I know you have many women on your village health and conservation teams and you have many women farmers. Um, what's the unique role that you see women playing and what are the kinds of services that you think women in particular need in order to be empowered in the conservation space in the in the area that you're working in? Yep, the, the unique role I see that women play, we're very lucky that um, in our model, I guess, because it combines both health and conservation, it gave us an opportunity to really engage women. And it showed it showed us the potential of and the ben of the benefits of engaging women in conservation. Because in the case of conservation through the very few women, um, for example, when I started out, Yes, I was a veterinarian, the first vet in the Wildlife Authority. There was hardly any female ranger. Actually, there was no female ranger and a few women at the headquarters as, as senior staff. 20 years later, that's about 20% of the rangers are women, which is a big improvement, although there's still some way to go. 
Um, but however, within our model, because it was a One Health model to conservation, we had to, we had to engage the women um, to talk about healthcare and family planning. And we had to engage the men to talk about conservation and natural resource management. And most women, um, when you talk about healthcare, it's normally a female issue. It's an issue for women. And conservation and natural resource management is an issue for men. But what we did is when we got some support from USAID, um, there was population health environment program. They said, you have to engage one set of people. You can either engage women, men, couples, or youth. And I looked around and all the youth I could see around me were married. You know, um, people start having babies from the age of 15. By the age of 25, they've had five. By the age of 36, they've had 10. And I thought maybe it's better that we go for couples because we also found out through a partnership with a university nearby, Barra University, they did a kind of a feasibility study. And through focus group discussions, it turned out that men were beating their wives when they're having babies, if they secretly get family planning. And then they, they stop family planning using contraceptive because they don't want to be, get beaten. Um, so we realized it was better to have, you know, both men and women engaged together and talking about these issues. Because for the men, it was more about balancing the family budget and for the women having more control over their bodies and their lives. Mm -hmm. And so this really worked. And in the end, we found that, you know, organically half the volunteers are men and half are women. And because of the, the women, they're able to talk to their communities about all these issues yeah. on top of the reason why they should also engage in conservation and natural resource management. And they're becoming leaders in conservation, just as the men are becoming very confident to talk about the benefits of family planning. So that gender equity is really, really important in such a community. Um, and yeah, we're really glad we're able to engage all of them equally. When it comes to coffee, coffee was another sector which has very few women. It's totally male dominated because very few women own land and you know, coffee farmers basically need land for coffee. Um, and we only had like the widows of people who owned land. But over time, the numbers have grown. When we started out with the Gorilla Conservation Coffee Enterprise, we had 75 farmers we started with. Five of them were women who owned the land. Um, although a lot of women till the land, they're always working as laborers on the coffee farm, but they were not owning the land and not able to benefit really from the coffee farming because you know they're not able to earn a living from it. Um, but now we've started to engage over 500 farmers through 25 model farmers, and some of the model farmers are women, some are reform poachers, and 130 of those women out of the 550 happen to be women farmers. So it's getting better, and they tend to be the better farmers, I have to say this. <laughs> <laughs> Our other extension workers are men, but they've admitted, they said the women on managed farms are much better managed. Than the men farm. Mm -hmm. I know. And even the nurseries, it's the women managing them. Well, <laughs> yeah, it's not so surprising though. <laughs> but, but but yeah, so that's how we're finding, and it's really making a difference. It's really making a difference because also with the women, when once a woman is educated, she's more likely to educate her girl children. And the, once the child gets to university, a woman gets to university, she's gonna wait to have her first child. And one of our best testimonies is our very first employee at Conservation Through Public Health called Vasta. She, her dad had the foresight to educate her. He was actually a traditional healer in the area, senior mm -hmm. traditional healer. But he educated both his girls and boys and took her all the way to university. She did a degree in tourism because the mountain gorilla tourism had begun and we hired her. And Vasta had her first child when she was 25. Um, she now has four children. Um, which is really good for a community where people start with 10 and she's a great role model for her community, but just shows how, what it does when you, when, what education can do for, for women in the area. That, <laughs> that makes me inspired to ask about your journey. I know you come from a long line of amazing women leaders because I've seen you post about it before. Um, and so I would love to know about how you, uh, Felt taking on such a senior leadership role at such a young age in a field role, no less. You said there were no women rangers at the time. And um, maybe tell us a little bit about uh, the role models in your life that, that led you to step up. <laughs> I've had a number of role models in my life. Um, some of them um, include famous people like Dr. Jane Goodall. <laughs> I used to attend her talks in London. Um, and Dr. Dan Fossey and Brita Gautikas, you know, I also attended her talks. 
but my mom has been a great role model in my life and she's just written a book my life is better weaving um i'm actually having a call from my home right now and she says hello um at the age of 92 she finally published her autobiography she was one of the first women members of parliament in uganda and helped, was a pioneer in the women's movement then was abolished by president idi amin in the 70s and then she reignited them in the 80s when president museveni came to power and she's a great inspiration and she totally encourages me to do what I want to do. So I've taken her to the gorillas, the chimpanzees, and she's just amazing. She's one of the donors to our organization. And so I've been very lucky to have had her in my life. Um, I think that has helped me to really get more motivated and more, it's given me a lot of confidence. Seeing my mother in leadership roles, she used to drag us along to her, you know, community meetings and things like that. Um, I think it's really helped me to become very confident. She was involved in developing the first wildlife statute in the country in 1996. She was so excited about it because then mm -hmm. I was working with the wildlife. So that's fantastic. And she's a fantastic mother. I mean, she's taught me how to be a better mother. Um, and uh, my, I was so happy that my son wrote a book about his experiences at the zoo when he was 13. And now he's, yeah, he wrote it when he was 16. And so she, it's just great when I've, I've got to understand the importance of engaging your children in conservation, engaging your parents in conservation. I turned my mom into a conservationist <laughs> when I set up the wildlife club at high school before I started. That was my first time to really get into conservation. And now she's a conservationist and we always encourage the young people in the community to, you know, to get involved in conservation and to encourage their parents to become conservationists. And so that that's really made a big difference. But I've just been lucky to have many role models in my life. Another very important lady is Professor Wangari Mathai, who unfortunately I never got to meet, but I've also been greatly inspired by her as well. Yeah, many women have inspired me and men as well. But I think I'll start off by talking about the women in this particular forum. <laughs> and maybe, yes, maybe just to add that uh, I'm a member of the Women for Environment Leadership Council, which is trying to get more women leaders in conservation. Um, started by Leila Haza for Lion Guardians, convinced me, Winnie Kiru from Conservation Kenya and Colleen Begg and a number of other women, Nyawira. And so we are basically mentoring women in middle ma senior management positions to be confident and head institutions. Because unfortunately, as much as there are more women involved in conservation now, not yet 50%, but there's hardly any women in leadership positions, heading institutions. And that needs to change, otherwise we're missing half of the equation. Amazing. Thank you so much, Dr. Gladys. This was so wonderful. I have a million other questions, but we will save them for the breakout room. So stay tuned. Um, and that's it. I will turn it over to you, Kylie. Thank you so much, Dr. Gladys. All right, thank you so much, Dr. Gladys. Um, it's so inspiring to hear about your journey and the intersection of human and wildlife health and all your contributions to advancing this field. Um, up next, we have Kaz Gioze, who is the Watershed Senior Program Director at Bonneville Environmental Foundation. She has worked in collaborative planning, ecological restoration, and socio-ecological research for over 25 years. Among many programs, Kaz and her team have spearheaded the development of Promise the Pod, an initiative that brings together habitat restoration programs across the Pacific Northwest to save the endangered southern resident orcas. The program restores streams that feed into the Pacific, plants trees that benefit regional habitat, and keeps waters clean, and engages the next generation of orca caretakers, which help these pods have the food and clean water they need to thrive. Today, she'll be sharing with us how she got into her current role, sharing some inspiring stories about the power of mentorship, and we'll be lending some advice to future females um, entering the forestry world. So without further ado, I will hand it over to Kaz. I just did something. Um, let me redo my sharing. And while I do that, I'll introduce myself. It is an incredible honor to be here. Um, I wanna extend a huge thanks to One Tree Planted and Planet Women. Um, you know, I, I sometimes struggle about um, days that celebrate women or other elements and think, what is there to say that we haven't already said? And I, and I will, I'm not sure what's happening with my presentation, but um, 
when I was asked to give this talk, I reached out to other women and received heartfelt, deep resonance with so many people with whom I work. Um, I am going, ah, what is happening? I might have to, oops, there it is. There it is, thank you. Um, I, I'll, I'll give a very brief introduction to the programs that I work in, but really, I'm gonna use my time to talk frankly to women, young women in particular who are joining this call, men as well, but um, to speak about the, the pathways that we need to forge together and the ways that mentoring and relationship building can help support us to craft new futures. So as um, Kylie, or Kylie and Joanna mentioned, I am so lucky to get to work in what I call the space of collaborative conservation. I work in three main program areas, Promise the Pod, which Kylie mentioned, in deep partnership with One Tree Planted. A lot of my work is centered in Washington State around floodplains by design, which helps advance needed integrated projects, often in highly contested floodplain spaces that are in really essential for agriculture, urban growth, as well as um, sustaining salmon that are critical um, tribal um, sacred foods and are protected by treaty rights, as well as a collaborative grow native plant procurement program and climate adaptation um, kind of network. But I'm not diving into that work today. I'm really speaking to you, frankly, about what it's like to work in male dominated fields of forestry and water resources. And I seized on what I love in memes of um, labeling, you know, interesting photos with the dynamics of the day. And if you look in the cab, it's the good old boys cab. Um, the world is changed and the situation is much better today than it was even 10 years ago. But these issues remain and persist. I'm sharing them in part because um, I didn't have this roadmap. And many of the women I work with and care for deeply also didn't have this roadmap. The roadmap is always changing, but this is um, hopefully information that will benefit those of you who are listening today. And so um, can I ask if I'm having, oh, pop-ups come there. Um, so here we're driving the truck. A little bit of my uh, identified some of the challenges in early career at the bottom, moving up towards the top. I'm heading towards my 50th birthday, and I've been in this field for a number of decades. And I can tell you these themes resonate across women who are in the field, who are doing more academic research work, and it's um, being accepted as a person who holds knowledge and skills as opposed to having to prove that over and over again in conversation, having access to experts and being accepted, whether it's by conference organizers, landowners, project reviewers, community groups. These dynamics have shaped my career and they have at once, at once made me really angry but fueled a passion to, in me to support women, to also redirect and change some of the dysfunctional dynamics that aren't just affecting women, you know, it, with other identities, whether it be race, sexual identity, other, these are magnified, but also these transfer into our management and stewardship and caretaking of natural systems. And there's just a deep recognition that these are dysfunctional and need to change. And so Kylie told me, Cass, you can't just be negative, you have to be positive. And so I'm moving in to my positive piece. And I, I apologize, my slides are being really funky today. But what do these cumulative burdens mean? So this is obviously, each individual carves their own path, but with myself and women I know, our paths tend to be winding, whereas men's can be more direct and mode a little bit ahead for them. We make career shifts because of some of the dynamics that are mentioned on the previous slides. 
we make lateral moves that don't advance our salaries and titles because there are systemic barriers to us. There's burnout, persistent wage gap. All of these factors weigh down the emotional, intellectual, physical presence that we bring to our jobs. It can make us stronger and can bind us together, but it can also make it lessons more difficult to learn and take more time erode some confidence. Um, it can also mean that sectors suffer because they don't retain qualified women in these really important roles. And I like to think of myself, especially as a young woman, as a little spider, a little spider just dangling from a string. I knew I loved people. I knew I wanted to work towards a more healthy and vibrant environment, but I just had my little string in a dysfunctional world and where am I going to attach the little spindles of my web? And as we know from li the literature, and there's many other factors, but in the working world, success is correlated with the degree to which you're connected to information and human networks, how when you make mistakes, how are those failures received by your colleagues, your communities, and others? Are you given space to fail? graciousness, support, or are you judged a bit harshly, provided minimal feedback and information? Well, research shows that in general, men typically receive much more access to these information networks, to healthy feedback loops when mistakes are made, to that graciousness and to that feedback. One of the reasons women have been held back is because we can be left out in, in ways. The good news is we have so many tools to build our own webs and strengthen these resources. And that is where I'm moving into today. And so for the young women and men out there in the world, your web might look a little funky. You um, are starting to draw your lines to areas where they have purchase and resonance with your ethics, your morals, your um, family you know, dynamics and values. And it's okay that it's a little lopsided at first. And as you work in through your career, I encourage all of you to deeply and intentionally think about mentors. And I'm gonna speak briefly about some of my mentors in my life. And also just give you some insight into where did I meet these people and what do they bring into my life? And for me, and this is what I count as a blessing of being a woman, Many of my mentors are human um, advisors, not so much people who teach me um, technical information, though that's a key piece, but people who resonate. I often ask the question unintentionally, do you know what I mean? And those, these are people in my life who when I ask, do you know what I mean? They either say, I totally know what you mean, or they ask me a really good question. Well, I don't think I do, but here's what I wanna ask you back. And so it's teachers, leaders, mirrors, questioners, who I have found in my life and hold dear and close to my heart. The first is Dot Fisher Smith on the left, who I met in India 21 years ago, volunteering for a same kind of human and ecological nonprofit organization. Dot is an activist, a um, truth seeker. She is a Zen Buddhist leader and present giver. She questions me, challenges me. She is a minimalist and she um, is a huge force of grounding in my life. And I am incredibly grateful for her. Next is Becky Margiata who runs an institution called the Billions Institute that teaches new ways of leading social change that ask us to look deeply at ourselves, at our own weaknesses, strengths, our tendencies to behave in ways that are perhaps ineffective and unintentional, but also to build deep relationships with others as a way of leading the change we really need to see in the world. Carmen Dove in the middle, who is someone I've known also for many decades and who is really a friend teacher. 
she is a no BS woman who says it like it is and doesn't let me get away with um, kind of skimming on the edge or speaking half truths. George was one of my first bosses as a natural resources technician. He took with grace some hard questions that I posed to him and is also a fountain of knowledge and technical expertise who I still rely on today. Hannah, who is next to the right, came into my life as an AmeriCorps member, um, working at the intersection of natural resources and houselessness populations. And Hannah is a doggedly committed worker in pursuit of social justice. And as I'm heading into the fifth decade of my life, I also know I can't on only look to elders and peers as mentors. I need to look to youth and people who see things I don't. And Hannah is one of those key agents for me. And finally, Shiloh George, who came into my life also through work, through work with Hannah at the intersection of trauma and nature. And Shiloh is a incredibly wise, deeply um, thoughtful, creative, also truth speaker. She isn't afraid to upset an entire room, but she does it in a way that also makes everybody laugh and um, express with joy the fact that she's disrupting some seriously dysfunctional, often patriarchal dynamics. And I cannot even say how much it's a privilege and a joy to get to work with and be shaped by not only these six people on the screen today, but an ever deepening web of relationships that have shaped my life deeply. And so finally, for those of you out there at whatever facet of the, your career you are in, your web, if you're like me, is your meaning. There's a podcast I love to listen to called How I Built This. And at the end, it's basically about interviewing entrepreneurs and hearing what, what, where did they, um, how did they get to where they are in this, you know, successful place. And at the end, the interviewer asks each person a question, what percent of your success do you attribute to hard work? And what percent of your success do you attribute to luck? And I will say, I, can, I attribute 100% of my success to my network and web of people who are continuing to teach me deep, powerful, sometimes painful, often inspirational lessons. And those teachers can be elders, youth, peers, join professional networks, um, join women's happy hours, join um, Saturday walking groups around affinities that are deeply important to you. But also remember, especially for us who see the hurt and pain of the natural world, the plants and animals can also be our mentors and teachers and show us grace, persistence, strength, resilience, and teach us very detailed lessons if we choose to give them that platform and space in our life. And last but not least, there's counter teachers. And those aren't people who are necessarily sitting on our kitchen talks, but they are people who might teach us through counter example of how do I want to walk in the world? And how is this person or system or institution making me feel and listening to that when it isn't positive and diving deep and saying, hmm, do I do that to others too? I think I might. How can I look at that example of counter teacher and say, well, who else in my network of plants, animals, elders, youth, peers, who I do look to as folks who walk on the earth in ways I admire, how do they do it? well, maybe I can do it more like they do. And what is my unique mix of personality, education, positionality, family, relationship, position me to do, to pave 
that path for others. And lastly, as I close, I don't think we want straight paths, you know, driving us all towards clear and known ends. And the muscle that I have built facing often dysfunctional systems has truly made me who I am. But I don't want other young women to face the pain of some of those experiences that are entirely avoidable. And I think I have one, I might have one more minute. And so I'm gonna say a little more about that. And I apologize for my presentation um, funkiness of slides, et cetera. But um, going back to the struggles women face, I have found that many of them are unseen and unrecognized even by ourselves. And as I've matured, I've learned more tools to listen to my body, to listen to my feelings, and to translate that often into intellectual direction and building muscle in collaboration, in listening. Partly that's, I believe, my nature, but those muscles have been honed by having to work as well. And the piece I did want to, to kind of bring up is, especially for early career women, in the natural resource field, you are often placed in very vulnerable positions, and it can be difficult to discern what's going on. Sometimes there are you know, issues of personal safety that can be questionable. And I, I guess I just want to share this message of these systems are not OK. For all of the men out there in the audience, it's your job as much as it is the job of women to correct the vulnerabilities, the burdens, the dysfunctions that can and do continue to place women in situations that just aren't healthy for our whole world. Um, and so in sum, I just wanna express my gratitude to my mentors, past, present, and future and my gratitude to be able to work with organizations that are emerging and receiving the recognition they deserve for being truly supportive. And those include the, the two sponsoring us here today, Planet Women and One Tree Planted. And I'm just incredibly grateful too to share this platform with the other distinguished women. So thank you very much. Oh, thank you, Cass. That was so, so, so magical. Um, I just want to take a moment to say that um, I'm so glad there are so many people on this call to hear that message and that we'll have a recording so that I can go back and watch that many more times. Um, thank you. So next, this is just, it keeps getting better, folks. We just, oh, what a great evening. Um, Next, I would like to welcome Isabella Cortez. Uh, Isabella is a friend and also a delightful person. She is the conservation director for Women for Conservation, a nonprofit that empowers women in rural communities in Colombia. Um, she directs two nature reserves in Northern Colombia. She was herself born in Cauca, Colombia, uh, in the Andes Mountains, and is calling in here today from the Sierra Nevada to Santa Marta. Uh, she spends her days working with local communities on environmental education, on public health and family planning, um, on career training and restoration projects, and uh, she also is a very, very talented artist and brings her creative joy to all of her work. And so I am really, really excited for you all to get to know a little bit more about Isabella today. So welcome, Isa. Hello everybody and happy International Women's Day. It's so nice to be here. It's an honor to be speaking with everyone and muchas gracias. I'm gonna show the slides. Okay, so my name is Isabela Cortez Lara. Uh, I am a person that is very, very inspired by the natural world. I am an artist since birth, practically, and also a conservationist. 
since very young. So my story begins in Cauca, Colombia. I am born um, in a family of Colombians from Valle del Cauca and Cauca. So my lineage is from the Colombian Massif, one of the most biodiverse regions on the planet. And it's the birthplace of three of the major rivers of Colombia. So I am an avant-garde conservationist mixing art, nature, and feminism. I am very inspired by many different works of art, uh, especially perform performance art and um, paint. I, since a very young age, have been a part of a, a large family of conservationists, ornithologists, botanists, uh, and artists. So since I was a very, very young girl, I was going on expeditions to either study species in nature reserves or to create nature reserves in the bottom left picture is a picture of me when we were first creating a nature reserve Pangan near Nariño in Colombia and I've also been a part of uh, the project Women for Conservation since I was very young like 10 years old so this is my story so welcome everybody I currently am managing multiple initiatives throughout Colombia and also Nepal. We with Women for Conservation have been working practically for 15 years. The organization began primarily working in Colombia around key biodiversity areas that are of really high biodiversity and endemism. Um, the, that is the main reason why we work in Colombia because Colombia has 10% of the world's biodiversity. As well as we empower women through different um, training pro programs uh, that are essential for the protection of these regions. For example, we train women, I train women and men, um, but we, we train them with conservation technology, with environmental education, with bird watching, with ornithologists, um, researchers, botanists. We do nature walks and talk about the species in the Sierra Nevada, in Chocó, in Tolima, Bronces Valles and many other locations. And I currently am based 100% of the time in the Sierra Nevada of Santa Marta, one of the most irreplaceable places on the planet with the highest level of endemism. So throughout these images, you can see that I am training people with drones. Uh, we are also having classes at schools, which is very important to get the kids very inspired. And also we have different women groups that we um, train them with uh, sustainable livelihoods trainings. The, the origin of this story comes from the deep lineage of warrior women that I have in my life, especially my grandmother, who is the center picture and is the logo of the organization. Her name was Amparo. She worked very, very hard to um, reach very inaccessible areas in Colombia and Cauca and to empower women in these very small towns with a lot of violence and war and destruction. She worked with a regional corporation at the time and she was mejoradora de hogar. So what she would do is she was a social worker and she united everybody to create community events and to do different programs and also to train them how to make crafts to sell and try to create sustainable livelihoods in these very difficult regions. Um, unfortunately, she died when she was very young. Uh, and she was sub subjected to uh, a lot of physical abuse by an abusive husband, uh, as well as my mother. So they firsthand experienced the horrors of machismo here in Colombia and not being able to speak out. So my mother, when she was 19, lost her mother and began her life on her own, became pregnant very young. And that's why we look like sisters. <laughs> but she was a very, very strong person in that moment when she had to be faced with these difficult issues. And she, my mother, finds solace and therapy through nature. And that's one of the main reasons why she's a conservationist and why she does what she does, because she became very connected and basically sought healing and the power of nature to be able to recreate and to be able to reconstruct her
her life and herself and has been dedicated for this for 22 years. She created Women for Conservation. She's the founder, one of the founders of Fundacion Paravis, of which she is the director as well. And she's directing both organizations. And she has given me an opportunity to, to be a person in this and lead as well. And then the bottom corner, we see my mother and we have this big event where we had an event with the Sierra Nevada um, called the Festival of Coffee and Cacao, where we talked about the importance of Shane Grove coffee and sustainable cacao in the Sierra Nevada and conservation throughout the Sierra. And I'm so proud to have my mom also attend today and it's her birthday. So really I'm doing this for her. I love you. So the way that I bring arts together with conservation is I seek solace through art and it's the way that I continue my work regardless of the situation. So I wrote a small poem that I would like to share with you. And it goes, I am a girl, I am power. I'm the magic that runs from my paintbrush onto the wall. Paint is my mentor because through it, I can lose myself in the madness of color. I don't have any other option to love what I do. With love and respect, I present my work with honor to you in order to demonstrate that art and nature are a double helix force. So for me, there is no separation between one and the, and the other. And I, be, I have become an expert at <laughs> creating connections and being able to manifest physically my um, experience with nature through painting and dance and song. So I have been in multiple events that we have been fundraising for Women for Conservation and fundraising and also just in general, like publicly speaking about family planning and, and education and gender equality and feminism. So through my art, I paint endemic species and I paint different scenes that um, depict the struggle as well as the beauty of our natural world. And I advocate for the conservation of these species through these pieces of work. So when I painted in the bottom corner, I painted the yellow eared parrot for 20 years worth of conservation. I did this mural with the community and I did it um, in partnership with uh, the local school and individuals in the community, as well as I was talking and um, doing outreach and obviously that the army was involved and many people of the community as well. So it's a talking point. It's a way to make heavy situations light because that's the best way to communicate. Um, you want to communicate through love and not through fear. And so that's how I do it through my art. So I wanted to share a little bit of our work here. Um, partnership with Planet Women, we've been able to expand our projects immensely and they have been an incredible force of nature with us. And so by combining nature, conservation, and women's um, empowerment, we've been able to create a very strong network throughout the communities, especially trust, because that's the most important part of working with people and creating projects, is not coming towards with a project and imposing it onto the community. No, we start with the community and the individuals and see what needs they have specifically and then incorporate it into the conservation plan, which is strategic. So by the way, by what we've been doing is we also saw that a, a major setback in generations is the fact that many young girls are becoming pregnant at 11, 12, 13, 15. Um, much like Dr. Gladys was saying in Africa, we have a very similar situation in Colombia. Uh, family planning, education is very important from the beginning, not just for women, but for men as well, which is something that we have been doing uh, as well, not just talking to the girls, but also the boys. And we've had implants um, implemented by Pro Familia, another of our partners here in Colombia, in Chocó, Amazonas, in Sierra Nevada, and we have continued to grow. The 10 locations here that you can see in the list are the locations where we've done multiple different projects um, from expanding reserves, consolidating reserves to environmental education and to sustainable livelihoods training. So one of the big things in Colombia is that Colombia is a country that is coming out of conflict, a conflict that has lasted for 50 plus years. So tourism is just now becoming evident and relevant. So Tourism can take a very dark turn 
as well and can create a lot of impact and destruction. So the idea is to train women how to do the best practices and how to be the most sustainable and how to create green economies within their communities so that they can grow, so that they have income, but also so that their, their environment is preserved. So here's the Sierra Nevada of Santa Marta is my main area. Uh, but, you know, I, I have so many different places that I love to go and visit and love to be part of. But the Sierra Nevada has a special place in my heart. Um, I am a daughter here of many adopted mothers and fathers. But one of the main things is this area is very high in spiritual, in spiritual um, importance. And there's a lot, a very high number of endemic species, the most um, recorded in a single area in the entire world. So it's part of the biogeographic province of the Sierra Nevada, the nature reserve in which I am managing. Um, there's two specifically, um, the El Dorado Reserve as well as the Perija Reserve, but I also oversee sustainability throughout the foundation of Provis. This nature reserve, uh, been living inside the nature reserve for two years straight. Um, and we have done everything from consolidate the boundaries and um, make sure that there are no invasions to pretty much every single detail in the operation. So we have a wonderful women's group there, 17 women who are training year round. Um, they are from the lo local buffer zone. So it's very important for us to work in the buffer zones around the nature reserves because of the fact that because there is a lot of pressure around the reserves, the conservation can't stop in the reserve. It has to go along with the, the management of the other people's or the property owners around the reserve. So we have a lot of farms around. Uh, there's uh, coffee farms, cacao farms, um, and there's also a lot of other kinds of agriculture. And now there's emerging ecotourism. So most of the women have trained um, on ecotourism. We've trained them in all sorts of different classes, including with a chef to teach them the techniques and also so they can receive people in their own homes and do a nature-based homestay tourism. My work that is a little bit tougher is managing and working directly with pretty much all groups of men. So uh, when I work, I pretty much am, have been in the field with only men. And I have seen that it's really difficult for a young woman to like obtain respect from men. So usually I have to be like work harder, work longer, walk further, carry more weight, and just like really like show myself that people like can like see that I'm actually working. So that's been definitely difficult in the conservation world, but I've I've done my hardest to to set up the reserves to consolidate them. This reserve, Chamisera de Peri High, is another reserve that I manage. And this is one of the reserves that I have literally walked the entire perimeter of 700 plus hectares with these really heavy posts that are pure cement that we walked up mountain after mountain after mountain to mark the boundaries, to make sure that the boundaries are very um, straightforward with the topographers and make sure that no one is coming in and illegal, illegal logging. Also cattle ranching is a really big thing in that area. So we've also had to get cattle out and talk to neighbors and it's a whole, it's a whole process. So what I want to say with that is that women have always been on the front lines. We have always been there. We have always been the ones that are the first heavy hit by any kind of climate change or any kind of climactic event or forest fire or drought. And I've had the opportunity to meet so many very strong women who are carrying the communities on their backs and that have received little to no credit at all. And I think that's not fair because women are the backbones of society and the backbones of the community. So that's why we work the way we do. And we cater first to what women need and to their specific um, problems within the community. And then we work from there because it's definitely a lot more efficient. And I also want to say that even though I'm dressed very nicely today, I'm usually covered in dirt. And even though, you know, there's butterflies and rainbows in conservation. Conservation is also life-threatening and conservation is also very tough. 
And so I've had my fair share of glory and I've also had my fair share of war. So I've basically had many different difficult situations where we've lost people on our team, where people have gotten basically threatened um, by their lives, but we continue no matter what. And actually the, the image in the middle was that we were marking part of the reserve and walking around this entire area and looking and going and just like the whole day there. And then a few days later, this sign pops up from the army and the army is like patrolling because there were bombs like mines in the ground. So we're always risking our lives. Our team is always risking their lives. Um, the forest guards are the heroes of conservation as well. I can't take away from the fight of men. There are amazing men in the, um, in the world and there's amazing people that are doing their best. And yes, we do need more equality, but I also honor the fight and I also honor the people who are on the front lines as well. Um, another of our projects where we had the honor to work was in Rences Valles Tolima Andean Project, Andean Parrot Reserve, which is designated to the conservation of the yellowed parrot, which is the parrot in the center of the screen. This parrot at 1998, which below you can see actually uh, part of my family, my stepfather and my father, and behind him, the forest guard of the time, Gonzalo. Um, they worked since 1998 to get a census of this parrot, which at one point was prevalent throughout the whole Andes, but in 1998, they counted 81 individuals. Uh, so it was on the brink of extinction. And they were able to, through uh, ecosystem services, community involvement, through the consolidation of nature reserves, um, the reforestation and restoration projects, they were able to get this species number up to 3,000 individuals in 2020. Unfortunately, um, well, this, this species was being guarded by our wonderful Gonzalo, who you could see was laughing with the women and was very lively. He was, he's the guardian of this species. Um, I was able to be with him for a month and learn from him as a mentor and be with him and his family, which was amazing because as you can see, he was, he's been with part of my family for 22 plus years. And it's been, it's been very tough because we lost him earlier and a year ago. And he's a great person who has left very deep roots and a strong legacy in this region and throughout conservation, his work lives on. So Gonzalo Cardona, uh, he was environmental leader, legend, guardian, mentor, and friend. Uh, his work was published, what he had worked on throughout in Audubon, in the Washington Post. He had planted over 7,000 palms. This palm, which I am next to, is a um, it's called Ceroxylon quindiniensis, which is the wax palm, the tallest palm in the world. And his project was basically, his work was reforesting this palm to be able to reestablish a uh, habitat for the yellow-eared parrot. So in the picture, we're planting trees and we're doing a project of planting um, a live fence around different uh, cattle regions, but just to create environmental um, corridors from one forested area to the next for migrants, as well as for the endemic species of birds and the yellow-eared parrot. So with that, I want to thank everybody and remind everyone that today is a wonderful day that marks the, the tremendous effort of many generations of women who have been fighting for equality and who will continue fighting for equality. And even though the going gets tough, the tough get going and there's no way we can give up and just continue to inspire and continue to move forward no matter what and always take time to smell the roses. Thank you. Wow, um, that was amazing. I am just continually inspired by your work and the mixing of art, poetry, conservation. Um, it's just fantastic to hear about your contributions to building and inspiring warrior women in the conservation field. Thank you, Isabella.
Um, I'm sure everyone has many questions for the speakers. So I'm going to open up the breakout rooms. You'll be able to choose which rooms you'd like to go into. Um, you'll also be able to change rooms throughout the discussion portion. You will have about 10 minutes to ask questions and then I will close the rooms, bring you back to the main session where we'll do some follow-up um, discussion on action items and things for um, the upcoming series. All right. All right, welcome back everyone. I hope you enjoyed your breakout session. Um, this concludes our first Women for Forest virtual event. Thank you so much to our speakers, Dr. Gladys, Kaz Giose, Isabella Cortez. We really appreciate you taking the time out of your busy schedules to present. I know I speak for all of us when I say it's been an incredibly, incredibly inspirational to hear about the work you are all doing. You've all paved the way and continue to pave the way for women leadership in the environmental world. So a huge, enormous thank you for all of your contributions. Our goal of this event was to leave everyone feeling motivated and to galvanize action. So in that spirit, we're going to leave you with three action items. First, we have created an online group via LinkedIn for us to continue the conversation on gender and environment. This was sent out in the event invitation and will also be linked in the follow-up email. We welcome you to join the group. We envision it as a space for women to network, have open dialogue about experiences, ask professional advice, share knowledge, stories, successes, and we will use this platform and the input from all of you to guide future events in this Women's for Forest series. As part of the Women's Fund for Forest, we will also be releasing a request for proposals or RFP application in the coming weeks. There will be opportunities to both donate to the fund and apply for funding. To briefly touch on the RFP application, there are options for financial and programmatic support as well as tree planting. Two critical program areas include improving forest health and increasing women's leadership and agency. Support from the fund will go towards high quality reforestation and agroforestry projects, supporting women foresters, women smallholder farmers, and indigenous women, and building the capacity of local partner organizations to hire, train, and promote more women leaders. If you are interested in applying, stay tuned for more details on the RFP in the coming weeks. Finally, One Tree Planted is hosting a couple women's focused community planting events along with our Global Earth Month volunteer initiative throughout April. So if you wanna get involved and volunteer at a tree planting event, stay tuned for information on those as well. I know that was a lot of information, but don't worry, we are going to be sending a summary of all these action items in the follow-up email, as well as a recording of this event. So from the One Tree Planted and Planet Woman team, I want to thank everyone for attending and to wish you all a happy International Women's Day. I look forward to seeing you all at the next event and chatting with you in the LinkedIn group. I'll now take you all off mute to say thanks and goodbye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank, 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 thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thank you.